So welcome to people who are listening. This is uh, Birth Psychology, the what, the why, the how with Dennis Hertenstein. So go ahead, Dennis. Uh, thank you, Kate. Uh, can you hear me all right? Do I need to talk any louder or am I okay? Am I talking too loud? No, I think you're good. If you want to move a little closer to the microphone, that might help, but. All right, I will. So, how about now? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Quite a question I have before we get started. Will I be able to see the hands coming up at all, or is that something you're... Well, well let's try it, but you got to move a little bit to your right, because you're starting to come off the screen. Oh. All right. Yeah, there you go. All right. Better? Yeah. Okay. So ask your questions. Yes. Well, um, no, I just wanted to know that. Right. Um, well, welcome, everybody. I am really, really pleased to have this opportunity to talk to all of you. Uh, it's just an amazing moment in time for, for APA and for babies and for baby consciousness. And the world is ready to hear that babies are actually conscious beings. And in fact, you and I and all of the people on this planet, but all the people on this call or on this, in this moment, on this, in this presentation, all have something really important in common. We were all born and we're all human. We share more than we, uh, we share more than we don't share from the standpoint of genetics, from the standpoint of, of the human experience. And from the standpoint of being born, we all have different stories about our birth and our, the time that we're born. Some of it we may know about, some of it may be mythology from our family. Uh, some of it may be extremely factual from our family. But from the point of view of the baby, that particular story isn't usually told because our culture doesn't really, at least we pretend that babies really don't have enough consciousness to ever remember that particular part of their life, which of course is totally wrong. There's tons of evidence showing that, both anecdotal evidence and, uh, and maybe not double blind study evidence, but there is some of that as well. Um, so the fact is we all have a lot in common. And what I'm gonna tell you tonight is really stuff you already know. There won't be one thing that I'm gonna tell you tonight that you don't already know. Now you may not know you know it. You may not know that that it even exists in the knowing that we usually use, which is our cognitive mind, our prefrontal cortex, and our 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 neocortex. But down deep in your reptilian brain, in your body, the parts of your the parts of your being that uh, that aren't cognitive, that aren't um, available usually to most of us. Of course, many of your body workers, you know how available that, that information can be. Any of you who are a psychotherapist, you know many amazing ways of getting to that information. Uh, so we all know it's there. Now we have another thing in common, all of us, this group, wherever might be in this call. And that's that for some reason, you're all here in this moment at this time, listening to this talk, something persuaded you to do this. Whatever that was probably had something to do with your birth experience. The fact that you're even choosing to be involved in birthing issues means that you probably have some birth experience bubbling up to the surface, probably has bubbled up to the surface for, for quite a long time. It might have even directed you to be the kind of professional that you are. Um, and, and in the kind of profession that you're, that you're in. I, when I was, I thought back when I, I was teaching, I've been teaching for 30, about 35 years, uh, teaching mainly chiropractic, board certified courses and all over Europe and, all, and mainly on the West Coast of the United States. Also, I've taught a lot of birthing professionals. Um, but when I was teaching about 15 years ago, suddenly it came to me. When I was 11 years old, approximately, maybe 12, maybe 10, all of my friends were buying models of, oh, trucks and cars and things that they could customize and making this some really cool thing. 
the only thing I was interested in, the only thing I wanted for Christmas that year, the only kind of model that I could possibly want, and I was obsessed with wanting it, was a skull. They had, at that time, they had anatomically reasonably cor uh, correct and accurate anatomical skulls that you could buy right next to the, the jalopies and the, uh, and the customized cars. And that's the thing I wanted. I wanted one of those skulls and I spent hours putting it together, painting the, the bits and pieces. And some many years later, I stumbled into cranial work in the early days of it. Well, the early days before Upledger and before some of the people who began teaching it more widely. And I was drawn to it. Now, why was I drawn to it? Well, I think my birth might have had some small part to play in that. Uh, and when I say small, I'm being facetious. Uh, 72 hours of labor, uh, scopolamine, and I'm not going to go into detail because I don't want to be activating everybody on this call. But, um, and then isolated in an isolate. And many of you who have worked in the hospitals know that they even call those little things that put babies into isolates. And I spent 60 days in the hospital after I was born, away from my mother because they felt that Babies shouldn't be touched um, because they might get germs, whatever. I didn't nurse, and there were horrible things that happened during that 72 hours. We had a very loving doctor who, who, who delivered me. He was, a, he was our family doctor. He was a very kind man, but it was a very difficult, very difficult birth. In this day and age, it would have been a C-section, I'm sure. But the point being that those imprints went into my nervous system at a very young age, and abandonment was always an issue to me. I didn't know what it even meant, and I didn't know anything about the word, but I developed many, many wonderful defenses to keep myself away from that, that particular eventuality. I also, claustrophobia was also a huge event for me. It was, a, it was a big, big piece of my life. And the only two houses that I've owned have been one house on the edge of the Great Plains in Western Minnesota, and another house was on was, was in the sand dunes on the Pacific Ocean, a funky house in the dunes, looking out over the vast Pacific Ocean. There's no doubt that I was that that, that imprint from my birth had something to do with those two choices and why I gravitated in those directions. There's no way that I would have bought a house in the middle of the redwoods, in spite of the fact that I love redwoods. So the point being, death and birth are the two biggest things that happen to us. There's nothing bigger throughout our life. We've all had traumas, we've all had emotional traumas, physical traumas, and they're big. Many, many things are big. If you lived in Syria right now, you'd be traumatized. I mean, there's all kinds of things that can traumatize us in life. But the birth experience and the death experience are probably the biggest. In any case, biggest or not, they're big enough to have put imprints into our nervous system. And every one of you have something. I don't care how nice your birth was, how brilliant it was, if it was in water, it was all done exactly perfectly, whatever that means. Uh, from the baby's point of view, it's a life and death event. And some are better, some births are much easier than others, and they don't all show dramatic clinical dysfunction by any means, or the human race wouldn't be here. Um, the fact is we are incredibly well adapted to getting born and our bodies are designed, are, have evolved or have, are designed to, to get through a birth canal. The skull can compress, the, uh, the, much, of the, much of the body is cartilaginous and membranous, so it can compress and then get through the birth canal. But not without the potential for who knows what. So you're all sitting here listening to this talk and I'm the vice president of, of the Association for Parent Prenatal Psychology and Health, vice president of the board of directors. And I donate my services as everybody in the board does um, because it's our, it's our passion. You wouldn't be taking this wherever you are in Australia or the US, wherever you are right now, you wouldn't be taking this time out of your life to sit here and listen to this if you didn't have some issue someplace in your body, in your nervous system, in your being that drew you to want to understand this stuff. 
um, that will teach you over the years how to be with babies, how to be with children, and how to do this work. And what I want to tell you is that you're already qualified to do much of the healing work that babies need. You're already qualified. As a mother, you're uniquely qualified if you let your maternal instinct rise up. As a father, you're also uniquely qualified if you let your, your paternal instinct rise up. None of us would be here. None of our forefathers, none of our, none of our past, none of the people that led to this moment in time and allowed us to be here, if they hadn't developed the methods of, or the maternal instinct within themselves and the paternal instinct, none of us would be here. Our ancestors would have never made it to the point of passing the genes on. So I want you all to feel empowered by the time I get done with this short talk we're gonna have. I want you all to know that when you're sitting with a baby, like this picture that you see on the screen this moment, that baby is a full, a fully evolved being. It just can't speak French yet or English. It can't do mathematics. It can't make its right hand pick up a cup of coffee. That little baby, and I say it, I don't mean it's a thing. I just, just don't want to be gender prejudiced. That little person is fully developed. When you look into that little being's eyes, you can see it. Any mother who lets her maternal instinct come up, comes up, and any, any mother who lets her, truly lets her maternal instinct rise up, knows the truth of what I'm saying already. You cannot look in your baby's eyes without knowing that. If you look into the eyes of your best friend, who's just had a trauma in her life, a big trauma of some sort, even if you can't change her pain, you can't change the event that caused the trauma, you can't cause her to unhave the trauma, if you just look into your best friend's eyes and get what she's feeling, and just hold the intention of getting. Just hold the intention with empathic attunement, with connection, with love, with caring. If you can just sit and look at that best friend in the eye, maybe touch their hand, and let them know that you know. Their central nervous system, speaking from a very cognitive point of view, their central nervous system will down-regulate immediately, absolutely. The adrenaline and the fight or flight response, the HPA cycle, will downregulate. Their whole system will downregulate. It can be measured if one wants to do such a thing, but you can see it in their eyes. It's no different with the baby that you're holding who's just had a life and death event, which they all have had. It is to get into this world is not a simple matter from the baby's point of view or from the mother's point of view. Of course, who am I to speak for mothers? If it were up to men to have babies, there wouldn't be very many of us, I'm, I'm afraid. Women are a lot stronger than men when it comes to this sort of thing, as far as I'm concerned. I have huge respect for, uh, for women and what you all have done and can do. And what my mother went through, she went through hell. It was very difficult. From her point of view, it was a horrendous birth. I came out with a pointed head, black and blue from head to toe. My breathing stopped eight times in 24 hours because of the scopolamine and the shock that I was feeling. Uh, my mother's sister saved me. She was a student nurse, woke up at four in the morning in a Minnesota snowstorm, came across to the nursery and saw that I was turning blue and put me in a machine that she wasn't supposed to put me in because she was only a student and revived me. And so the point is, my mother had a horrible time. I had a horrible time. My particular circumstance ended up giving me complete, I was in shock for months afterward. If some of you understand what parasympathetic shock is, you just leave. It's, uh, it's a condition that causes you to just leave your body and be gone. And that's pretty much where I spent my time. They had to revive me to feed me for two months or more, three months, I don't know how long. A long time. Now, nobody ever asked me how that affected me. I was born in 1947. We 
didn't think in terms of, I mean, parents in those days didn't even, the doctors in those days didn't really believe that babies really had a lot to say. Uh, in fact, they did a lot of surgeries without any anesthetic on babies in those days. Can you imagine taking this little baby on the screen and uh, even circumcising it, which is absurd anyway, in my opinion. There's no reason to ever circumcise anybody. Uh, but that's another discussion. So, uh, yes. So, I want you all to feel qualified to sit with a baby just like you will your best friend. Look that baby in the eye and just listen. They're not going to tell you the story in words. They're going to tell you the story in their body. Now, you don't have to take hundreds of hours of classes to understand how to read a body. You already know how to do that. You're a human. You look at a friend, you can read their body possibly. You look at a baby, you can do the same. Just get that that baby has something to say. They say it with cries. They say it with body posture. Trust your intuition. Take a breath, drop into your own birth journey, and you don't need to know what it was. You do know. You absolutely know. You know every single second of it. But you don't know. Not the way our Western world of consciousness, lack of consciousness, in my opinion, wants us to believe. We can only know things with our neocortex and our prefrontal cortex. We can't know things with our amygdala and our reptilian brain. Why don't we do? In fact, we know far more with those parts of ourselves and, and in our body and in the belly brain. And there's Anyway, there's a whole lot of other ways of accessing this. So trust that. Your body knows how to do it. Sit with it and let it happen. Those of you who are body workers, you'll know techniques. Don't, don't de-skill yourself. Take those skills, but then put them aside as far as your cognitive mind and just let the baby tell you what she needs in that moment. She'll look you in the eye and she'll tell you. You'll hear it in some way. However you hear those kinds of things. Might be in words in your own head. I sat in France. I taught a whole series of courses in Paris and another series in Lyon. And I don't know how much many of you know there might be some French people on this call even. But the French people really don't want to speak English if they can avoid it, uh, especially in Paris where I was teaching and in Lyon. Um, it, French is the language. It's the language the world should be speaking as far as they're concerned. And their babies definitely don't want it. I mean, they don't hear English. And I can't speak French. And I spoke and I had a number of many sessions that I did in classes in Paris and in Lyon. And I sat with those little babies, and also it was true in Stockholm and Norway, and, and Oslo in Norway, um, and even in London, where they speak a strange brand of English that uh, it's hard for Americans to understand. But anyway, um, just kidding. But anyway, when I when I sit with those when I sat with those babies and looked them in the eye, they knew that I knew, they knew that I knew that they knew that I knew, and the, and by the time I got the knowing and getting it. They knew that their parents knew that they knew that they knew. And that's where it's at. You create a space within which communication occurs that's not about words. It's about that look in that baby's eye and that, and that picture right in this moment. It's about the baby's pushing your hand away or taking your hand and putting it right where it needs to go, which is what a little newborn baby will do. They're not supposed to know how to do that, but they do. So I want to empower you all to get it, to get that babies are conscious, they're fully evolved beings. This is just my belief, but it's not a belief. It's a knowing on my end because I've worked with thousands of babies in a number of different countries now. And I've, there've been too many, in quotes, coincidences. Too many coincidences for me to ignore them. Too many moments where the baby just took my hand and put it right where it needed to go. Too many moments where the baby looked me in the eye without blinking longer than it should have and got that I got it. And all of a sudden their body let go and I could feel it. The mother could feel it, the father could feel it. All of a sudden the baby could put her mouth on the mother's breast without chewing the nipple up because of stress. And that's why babies chew nipples up. It's because they're in stress. It's not because their frenulum needs cutting, which is the latest fad in the medical, in the birthing world. 
They've got whole seminars on cutting frenulums. They call it revision, I guess. And it's totally absurd. It's such a rare occurrence that the frenulum is a piece of, it's a piece of um, material under the tongue that can tie, that can cause tongue tie where the tongue can't respond. That's an extremely rare condition, but what's not a rare condition is stress in birth. And if you're ever stressed sitting in a, in a dental office waiting for, well, waiting to pay your bill, probably that's enough, but waiting for your jaw, waiting for your teeth to be worked on it. If you see a bunch of dental, I mean, their jaws are tight, their shoulders are tight and their hands are tight and their whole bodies are tight. If you watch babies, they come out with their, with their hands and fists. You can't find their neck because their traps are so tight that they're, they're in a fight or flight state. The reason we do that is we, we activate our, our trap muscles and pull them to our ears to protect our neck. We just instinctively know how to do that. Um, and with that comes tight jaws because our lower jaw, the mandible, if it gets hit, it's extremely movable, extremely functional. Extre it has a large range of motion. If it gets hit, it's gonna do serious damage to us. And our ancestors 50,000 years ago instinctively knew that. And so we go into fight or flight state, which includes hands and fists because we're protecting our fingers. We need as humans opposing digits. That's why we put our hands and fists, maybe to fight, but babies aren't gonna fight. And babies come out with their hands and fists already. And they can't let go of their hands. And they can't, and those same babies have their shoulders to their ears because their traps are so tight. And, and you can't find their neck. And many of those babies have skin, le skin lesions because of it. The, the eczema and things as a result of the moisture that gets caught in those, in, those, in those folds under the skin. And with that always comes tight jaws to varying degrees. Uh, there's other things tight down below as well, pelvic floor and various things. But right now I'm talking about these three areas. So the jaw gets tight, the jaw gets tight and clamps on in mom's nipple or can't, or the baby can't suckle at all because the mouth doesn't work very well because they're in a fight or flight state. Try chewing something with your mouth open. Try chewing something if your jaw muscles, the muscles of mastication are in spasm. You can't. You can't even barely open your mouth and you certainly can't organize yourself to suck. Um, now what they're doing is they're cutting the frenulum and adding, along with circumcision, adding yet more stress to the baby. And almost never is it actually tongue tie. It's almost always stress. Um, and when I, I've had too many of those after they've done it, they're still in trouble. And I've had to do the work I do to release the trauma in their body so that they can suckle finally. Um, anyway, so beware of that. It's a bit of a sidebar, I suppose, but it does tie directly into the fight or flight state. So when you look into that baby's eye, like this mother is doing right here in this picture, and that baby gets that you get it, she'll calm down, maybe. Now maybe she'll be so stressed that she's overwhelmed. That might not be enough. You touch the body, you hold the body in particular ways, you find where the, where the tightness is, you gently release it, whatever way you feel comfortable doing. There are some specific ways, some of you who are body workers know how to do that. Um, but don't worry about knowing how to do it. Let the baby show you. You're not going to hurt the baby. It's nothing, it's, there's nothing, you can't do any more than what's already been done to them. You're not going to. Whatever's happened to them is way bigger than anything you can possibly do. So don't worry about doing it wrong. You can do it wrong 10 times, but the intention gets through to the baby. And just your intention to try to relieve their tension in their body, just your intention and your attention. Where is your intention and where is your attention? That baby gets it. Truly get that that baby is a fully developed conscious being. Can't speak the language yet, can't play piano, can't read a book, can't pick up a coffee cup. So what? That has nothing to do with consciousness or very little to do with consciousness. What does have to do with consciousness is being able to look in mom's eye and to get that mom's looking in your eye and to feel it in your body. That's consciousness. So I want to empower you all to know that your friend's baby, your own baby, somebody else's baby, you can sit with and you can let go. You can help them let go. And you can model for the parents that in fact that baby does have something to say. You can say, so what does that cry sound like to you? What is that, what is, what is, what is her cry sound like? What, are, what is she saying? 
Well, they don't get that she's saying anything except that her diaper needs changing her. Maybe her, you know, she needs to eat. And sometimes that is what she's crying about. But if that's not the case, mom will, mom and dad will suddenly get that, oh, that cry does it. You know what? I associate that cry with, well, right after she was born, there was this, well, I remember that cry. Yeah, you're right. There is something about that cry that I think she's angry. I think she's upset. I think she's disoriented. I think she's disturbed in some way. Um, that, so listen to the cry, get what it has to say, and inform yourself. Let the baby teach you. At the same time, learn everything you can learn about baby consciousness. Kate White and her associates, the people, the people around her, especially Kate, but the people around her have created an, this amazing course that puts you in touch with stuff that I wish I could have had 35 years ago. Uh, when, when I first discovered that there was such a thing as, as birth trauma, and when I discovered there was such a thing as babies having imprints from birth. You have the most amazing opportunity because of APA and because of what's been done by people who are essentially donating their services. I mean, Kate gets paid a pittance as far as I'm concerned, but she's so devoted to this and so completely committed to all of this. And uh, that we, have, we now have a two part, well, more than that really, but a two, there are two, two trajectories. We will have a somatic part and there's a cognitive part. I'm not sure if you call it that, but there are two different parts to the training program. And I'd really, really, those of you who are listening that haven't started the course, for those of you that have started the course but are having trouble getting going into it, really dive into it. It'll give you permission. It'll give you permission to do what I've just said. It'll give you, it'll give you the foundation upon which to build a connection to all babies. You'll suddenly find that when you're in an airplane and there's a baby two seats up on the right, wet the other side of the aisle from you, that baby's gonna seek your eyes out. And that happens all the time when you start to understand what I'm telling you. It happens all the time. Why? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But it does. Too many coincidences. Of course, I don't believe so much in coincidence anymore. I believe in synchronicity. Um, but that's another discussion. So take the courses, come to the congresses at APA, listen to some of these amazing speakers from all over the world. There's, we, the APA brings together people like you who have a passion or are developing a passion for understanding that part of life, the part of life where we start. And it's prenatal and perinatal. It's, it's, it starts at conception. It starts in, with the energy of the mother and father when the baby is conceived. It starts way, way back. Um, and that's a bigger discussion. So access the resources that APA has, and APA will lead you to other resources. There's a lot of amazing people that have been drawn to APA for 35 years um, from all walks of life and everything from uh, high, highly placed medical doctors in their field who used to be left brain analytical, reductionist scientism sort of people that have now suddenly come to this place of understanding what I'm talking about. It, they don't get rid of the reductionism and the scientism, which is really powerful stuff and important. There are some things that can't be proven and some things that can't be uh, done with double blind studies. And they get that. And there's people that are body workers, many body workers who have just moved into the direction because of their intuitive take. No accident that people become body workers. Uh, chiropractors, which I happen to be, um, I have been for 45 years. Uh, I practiced in Santa Rosa, California. I practiced in Minnesota for 15 years. I've been in California for about 30 years. I, uh, th there are all kinds of professions psychotherapist, which is where this all, all this work actually originated, from a psychiatrist from, from Canada, and a psychotherapist, uh, David Chamberlain, from the US. They've got together and created APA 35 plus years ago. 
uh, out of frustration because the American Psych Psychological Society, I can't remember the name of it, American Psych Psychology Association would not present, would not allow them to present a paper 35 years ago or so about uh, that babies were conscious and that, and that a lot of psychodynamic issues that psychotherapists are dealing with originate from the birth experience. And they had a ton of evidence to show this was true. Um, and they put together a brilliant paper at that time. And it was rejected because it was just rejected out of hand because they all knew that babies had nothing to say. Babies weren't conscious. Well, we know better now. And actually a lot of people know better now. This is the time right now. There's a, there are things happening all over the world right now. They aren't all about birth issues. They're about ecology. They're about treating the earth differently. They're about earth consciousness. They're about child consciousness. They're about elderly, taking care of the elderly and taking care and, and things like uh, uh, um, hospice, um, taking, helping people out the other end of life. There's so many things happening all over the world and there are pockets, there are pockets, there are bubbles in almost every country in the world right now. And there's a lot of those bubbles that have people who have come to Africa and connected with Africa. So we know that. We have people from India, from anyway, from Africa, from South America, from uh, traditional societies, uh, all from Islamic, Christian, Jewish. I mean, it, it's all over, it's everywhere. And it's not just about birthing. There's so many things happening in the world and this is part of it. There's a change taking place. You're not going to see it. You're not going to see it in the newspaper. You're not going to see it in the news tonight. You're going to see other totally absurd things going on that have nothing to do with consciousness. In fact, they're quite the contrary. But if you look at their other sources, thank God we have the internet and ways that we can access that information and those people now, which is here I sit with my little iPad being essentially digitally ignorant and because um, I just don't spend the time with computers that I probably should and would like to, having been born in 1947, I still use a pencil with an eraser which says delete on it. And that's about what, how far I've come. Uh, but I do have my iPad and I'm sitting here talking to you through an iPad and to who knows where. I mean, it's just an amazing time. And we, and APA is acutely aware of that and really aware. And APA is getting the information out there. We're getting it out there and we need your help. We need everybody's help. Anybody who has passion for this. The first step is to take, take the, the module series, learn like I wish I could have many years ago. I spent hundreds of hours taking courses that had almost nothing to do with baby consciousness. They might have had a little snippet here and there or something. And books, I read books, book after book after book, found people, finally found some people that could tell me some of the things. That, and I finally discovered where some of my psychodynamic tendencies come from, uh, which I would have never found had it not been for birth consciousness and baby consciousness understanding. Look at that picture of that little girl. Oh, it's amazing. Anyway, um, so yeah, educate yourself, but don't wait. You'll never be fully qualified. I don't care who you are. You know, 45 years doing what I do, I'm not fully qualified. Every single baby I see says something to me. I have to wipe my mind. I have to wipe my. I have to. I have to wipe all the information out of my head when I see the baby, so I don't have any preconceived ideas of what that baby's going to tell me, because her body's going to show me something different. And every baby has taught me something different. If I'm willing to listen, if I'm willing to be present, and it's all about presence attention, intention, powerful, powerful things. Presence, attention, and intention. If you just sit quiet, and humility. Humility is an absolute necessary ingredient. Just know that you don't know and be okay with that. I don't care how qualified you are in your own field. I don't care how many courses you've taken. I don't care how many spiritual journeys you've been on or how many spiritual teachers you sit with. The end of the day, the human experience isn't, does not require all of that training. It just requires sitting 
with attention, intention, presence, and love. Whatever that means. It's a big suck with love. So trust yourself, sit with it, and educate yourself both. Do both. Any cognitive understanding without without intuition and without attention and intention is really empty. But it's also true that that intuition without knowledge can be dangerous in a certain way. It can be dangerous in the sense, or at least it can be less, you can go much further if you can do both. I shouldn't have word, used the word dangerous, it just occurred to me, because I don't want you to feel like anything you can do with a baby is dangerous, unless you overwhelm them. But you're not gonna do that. What you do is let the baby be your guide, let the baby tell you how far to go and what to do, and you're not gonna overwhelm them. It's okay if you, if you, it's okay if you do it wrong for a moment, as long as your forces aren't very big, as long as your intention isn't, as long as your presence with the baby isn't overridden by your by what you think you know. Let your cognitive self kind of go away, even though you have educated yourself. All of the Apple courses and many, many other speakers and people who are teachers, still let it all go and sit with that baby and let that baby tell you. They've come in with understanding. It's like an hourglass, the way I see it. They've come from somewhere, uh, whatever your belief system is. A very big place, in my opinion, very big place. And then they're squeezed down through this little hourglass space where one small little kernel of sand at a time can come through. And then they widen out again into who we adults, hopefully, will become more and more conscious. However, they have come in with compressed consciousness. They have within that, that picture that I've just given you. They've come in with compressed consciousness, but they've come in with complete consciousness. They know, they know, trust that. Um, I've studied cranial work for many years and I've taught it for many years. And there's a lot to be known about the nervous system and about how the nervous system works, about how the brain is divided up and about how, where the nerves go and which nerves control the arms and hands and fingers and which nerves control which fingers, and which nerves control which part of the leg and uh, which nerves go to the heart, lungs, digestive system, whatever, and how you might affect all those things. Those are really useful things to know. And they'll help inform you if you choose to go that route and work with babies in that way. But at the end of the day, if you can just sit with them and let them tell you, you're not gonna know what you, what you fix. They're just gonna start feeling better. And of course, if you do it, it'll be considered spontaneous remission because that's what I do for a living, basically, spontaneous remission. But it's not that. You, you'll start to see enough babies feel better that it'll be clear that what you're doing is helping. So trust your trust the fact that you're human, that you've been born, that you were a baby, that maybe you've had a baby or two, that you've raised a child or two. Trust all of that to inform you. Trust your own your own trauma, your own birth trauma to inform you, as mine does every time I sit with a baby. I don't sit and think about my birth trauma. I can talk about it in all kinds of ways now. I put it aside, but from deep within. Every time I sit with a baby, that part of me informs me and sits with me and helps me tune in and helps me be with that baby. Empathic attunement, if you write that word, that, those two words down, empathic attunement is a powerful, powerful force. Empathy with tuning in. Empathy with holding the intention of tuning in. Powerful stuff. So Kate, do we need to create some space to have some questions? We've got about 15 minutes left, I noticed. I'm sure we could, looks like we have one already. All right, why don't we open the next 15 minutes to questions? Okay, um, well, Dr. Sobti says, Dennis, please throw some light on how you do cranial work on babies, on children or adults. In short, I don't know much about it, thanks. So, 
well, what kind? Well, it doesn't matter. I was going to ask what kind of doctor you are, but it doesn't make any difference, really. Um, I've got this is going to be the short version, but if you listen to this, it's a very short version, but if you listen to this, it'll be enough. The rest of it will come out of this. Okay. Birth is always about compression and contraction from the baby's point of view. That baby was compressed, and I don't care if it was a C-section or a vaginal birth. It's always about compression and contraction. That's what injury is. That's what trauma is in the body. Okay, number one. Number two, if, and number two is the center line of the body is the spine. The primal midline of the body is around the spine. It's the line around which everything's organized, two arms, two legs, and so on. And it reaches up to the head, and there's two halves of the brain, and so on. So the point is, that's the, pr the primal midline is the center line. Now, number three, if you put a hand under the sacrum, which is the low lowest end of the spine, and under the occiput, which is the uppermost end of the spine, and decompress gently, very gentle, just a little bit of decompression. Doesn't take much. The younger the baby, the less it'll take. That baby's body will start to show you where the tension is. The baby will start to go into the positions that they were stuck in or that caused the distortional patterns, the trauma patterns. If you start there, everything else will come from that. Now I could talk about all the nerves. I could talk about, you know, spinal. I mean, I can I can tell you that's because I spent years talking to chiropractors who they want to know that you know the neurology and I know functional neurology. I can talk that language, but you don't need to know it to do this. If you do that and that let, and then let the baby's body show you. Now also you're doing this with what I harped on earlier which is empathic attunement, eye contact, involving parents to create what I sometimes call a womb surround or a safe space within which the baby can unfold the story. If you convince the parents to get that that cry that's coming from what you just started is a cry that has something to say, if they can get eye contact and if the baby can can get that mom gets that the baby gets that mom gets it, things will start to change. Now, the one last thing about that I'm going to say, because we don't have time to get heavy into this, as far as the technicality of it, but one last thing that I'm going to say about this is the older the baby, the harder it is to do what I just said. Then you have to know a bit more. Because they've already, from the time they're born, if the trauma is big enough, they're already starting to build castle walls around the trauma. They're already creating barriers because they know how to survive or they wouldn't be alive. They have, they've been given that ability by, their, by all of our ancestors. And they know how to, and one way to survive is to wall off what you can't fix. And lastly, the family structure will also create the castle wall around the dysfunction. But that's a bigger discussion, and it, there's more psychodynamic conversations that could be had around that. But the younger, that's why, I, that's why I'm, my passion right now is to teach birthing professionals how to do this work. Because the sooner you get them, the more you're going to eliminate quicker. There's no question. There's no doubt in my mind that autism, Asperger's, uh, ADHD, they're all related to overwhelming trauma. The best definition of trauma that I've ever heard is anything that overwhelms your resources. And those, those children and, and adults can't handle any more sense, sensory input because their nervous systems are holding so much trauma. Now, they're also sensitive to red dye number whatever and all kinds of other stuff, but that's because their nervous system is already at a high level of protection and, and, uh, and a high level of hypervigilance. And that's enough to be said right now. Okay, thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Dr. Sopti. Would anybody else, uh, Polly? I'm going to bring you on, Polly, a uh, part of our panel, and you can talk live with Dennis. Let's see. Oops.
Okay, Polly, go ahead. You're on live. Oh, super. In my area, the, the topic of tongue tie and lip tie is really hot. And it's being done a lot. And almost to the point where it seems like if a mother cares uh, enough to have this revision done, then she's the better mother. Are there any papers or anything that you could um, advise me to read that there that, that would counter some of this without it looking like uh, I'm the stereotype of the people of the person who doesn't uh, do the. the I'm afraid I missed part. I I missed some of your words rolled. Okay. Over so maybe maybe Kate could just summarize your question. Uh, the where where do you live, Polly? What area of are you in the United States? Central Illinois. So in Central Illinois, there's a lot of women who are being convinced that tongue tie, frenulum, you know, phrenectomies are part of good mothering. That um, that it's being done so frequently now. It's it's kind of been made. Um, made normal and she wants to know if there are any resources or papers that, that you could recommend uh, uh, right probably not because there's a huge amount of money being made around that right now and they're not going to do research to show anything anything different um, there's and so many the dentists are doing it even I mean it's unbelievable to me uh, lactation consultants and doctors and anyway it's not it's Rampant. I didn't know that until I went out and taught a course that Kate sponsored in Virginia. I was a, wasn't aware that it had become the latest fad in the medical world. Uh, but it's if anybody reads about fight or flight, they'll know that jaws get tight when you're in a fight or flight state. They just do. And babies' jaws are always tight. I, well, not always. If they're severely stressed, they're always tight. Now, they're not always unable to suckle. Quite often with tight jaws, you can still suckle. But, but sometimes you can't. Problem is after they cut the frenulum, they're still having trouble most of the time. The ones that I've seen. Uh, well, um, I can recommend a resource for you, Polly. That's um, Allison Hazel Baker. She has a, vid a video that she um, made called "Fo Tie Tongue Tie" or "Fo Tie Fo Tie F A U X False." And uh, in that video, she talks about uh, just what Dan, what just what Dennis is talking about, just stress and um, what how it manifests in the baby and in the fascial system. And I would recommend taking courses from her if you're interested. Uh, her website is AllisonHazelBaker.com. I think you can just Google her. She's a, a very famous uh, IBCLC, but also craniosacral therapist as well. And she has a PhD, so she's a fascinating person. But, there's, there's going to be more out about that because there's going to be a lot of opposition to it sooner or later. And it's going to, and you'll, you'll stay tuned to APA because anything that comes out, we're going to have it out there. Because it's another traumatic event for babies to have their, have the revision done. It's not okay. Uh, so, thank you for your question, Polly. Do you feel complete? Yes. Thank you very uh, much. Okay. I'm going to put you back into. Yeah. Thank you. So I have a couple of other questions here from people. Uh, here, hold on. I need to pull that down. So Dr. Sobti has a couple more questions. So I'm just going to pull her on the panel with you. Is that okay, Dr. Sobti? Um, I'm going to just find you here. Uh, it's a long list of names now here. Here you are. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Subti. Hello, Dennis. It has been really, really informative. I would really like to thank you here at the outset from India 
and would love to share this knowledge with all professionals i know here uh, i just uh, wanted to ask you do you recommend that this should be done to all babies because we keep delivering so many babies every day but i've never done this ever so we should try to do it once dennis yes well yeah i think i mean the birth journey is always potentially traumatic it's not okay. always clinically significant because yeah. babies can tolerate a huge amount of but late but who knows what happens later in life i remember you by the way you were at the congress right no i was i couldn't come myself as oh, i sent one of my friends there yes because oh, uh, it's but next time i won't miss it i'm sure <laughs> oh good 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 cuz i remember something about you it's great to yes. see you yeah yes. yeah yeah, uh, yeah they should all every, yeah. every baby should if you just did what i suggested just yes. some deep compression uh yes. and then let the baby on let the baby unfold its journey and let it tell its story let okay. the cry be your guide let the cry, try to help have help mom interpret what the cry means it will only take a few minutes it's not like it's you know if you have a half hour you could be yeah. amazed at what will happen in a half hour yes uh, if you're delivering a lot of babies you may not have time for that but you'll yes. be amazed at what happens I, of course i'm never going to do double blind studies and leave 500 babies suffering or 500 that i'm going to treat so i'll never be able to prove that but i yes. it's proven by the fact that all of a sudden they sleep through the night or sleep for four hours okay. it's proven by the fact that they can all of a sudden latch on and and they're comfortable and their baby their, their bodies are comfortable so anyway yes okay. every baby okay. uses it okay. okay a very small thing that which i learned from this module eight on labor and birth now whenever i deliver a baby i put it put the baby on the mother's tummy and let it have skin to skin contact for at least 10 minutes that little change which i have made in this last one month those babies are actually having perfect breastfeeding i at least have about a 50 whom i have delivered in the last 30 days or so this is my personal experience that how little changes which we do which we consider uh, we are knowledgeable but still we don't have knowledge there is so many things we still don't know so it has been really really great journey for me good for you good going i was so yes. impressed with the people that came from your your part of the country and the presentation they did when they were here yeah, i am so thankful and i would love to have you all here i always keep telling kate and we'll have a good medical session with all the doctors here and i would really organize something and invite all of you here so that we can also educate our professionals about this beautiful concept and something which is going to change the life of the baby i'd be very pleased to come to india and teach a course to birthing professionals there so if you can arrange something let me know and i'll be there it's just, this is sure. my passion there's only so much room in a coffin i really don't care about you know anyway thank you thank you so much dennis yeah thank you okay anybody else have a question you can put your hand up or ask a question Anybody? Anybody want to say a come on and have a little discussion with Dennis? Okay, there's nobody seems to come on a come on now, Dennis, so I don't see well, any 7 o'clock. Go ahead. Well, I just don't see any hands up or any questions or any chats, so is there do you have any final words? Uh Well, I just want to thank you all for your attention and thank you all for caring enough to take an hour out of your life to listen to this and uh, give me the opportunity to share these ideas with you. And uh yeah, thank you for being there and thank you for being in your world, the world that you're the worlds that you're in doing the work you're doing. You wouldn't be you wouldn't be sitting up listening to this if you weren't doing some amazing work out there with people. So don't ever get discouraged. reconnect connect with other people that think like we do we're always here kate can lead you to people to talk to to connect with one of the beauties of the congress every year every two years that we have is that suddenly you're in a group of people who already know that babies are conscious and to be with a group of people like that and to kind of instead of out there in the world where if you say that to people they kind of roll their eyes to be in that space just gives one so much encouragement and uh and it just 
you can feed off that for months afterward and go back to your work with 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 much more um, enthusiasm and trust. So congratulations to all of you for caring enough to be here and listen. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Dennis. And uh, you, Kate. And we're going to stop recording here. And uh, thank you for all for listening out there from the future of people listening. So.